Imagine we have two blocks that weigh one kilogram each. One block is made of glass and the other block is made of gold. Now both of these blocks are at the same temperature at 25 degrees Celsius. And we decide to heat both substances by the same amount. In other words, we transfer 5,000 joules of heat energy into both materials at the same time. Would the temperature of both of these materials rise by the same amount? And just a note here, we've placed some insulation around both our blocks to make sure that the heat we transfer into these blocks doesn't leak out. When we first think about this problem, we might believe that because we've given both substances the exact same amount of heat, and also considering they both have the same mass, intuitively, it would seem that both these substances should raise their temperature by the same amount. But rather paradoxically, we find that the gold's temperature has risen much higher than that of the glass. The reason for this all comes down to something called the specific heat capacity of a substance, and this is also sometimes known as the specific heat. Now, what is specific heat capacity? Well, the specific heat of a substance is defined as the quantity of heat energy required to change the temperature of one kilogram of that substance by one degree Celsius or one Kelvin. So specific heat at constant pressure is normally symbolized as C with a subscript of P. And this subscript indicates that the specific heat is measured at a constant pressure. Now, what does this mean? This means that the substance, whether it's a gas, liquid or solid, is allowed to expand or shrink in volume as it's heated or cooled. And what this means is that the pressure of the substance remains constant. So if we take this simple example of a balloon, when we add heat energy to this gas in this balloon here, so long as we allow this gas to expand as it's heated, the pressure of the gas will remain the same. So specific heat has units of joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. Glass has a specific heat of 837 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. And gold specific heat is 129 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. The higher this specific heat, the more heat energy transfer is required per kilogram to change the temperature by one degree Celsius or one Kelvin. So you may have already noticed that the direction of heat transfer can happen in both ways. We can add heat energy to the substance, increasing its internal energy. And in this case, the transfer of heat energy has a positive value. But the substance can also release heat energy back out into the environment and reduce its internal energy in the process. In this case, the heat energy has a negative value. And this is the convention that is used in physics for this heat energy transfer. So when energy is absorbed by a substance, Q is positive. When energy is released by a substance, Q is negative. The equation for specific heat can be written like this. So the specific heat capacity at constant pressure of a substance is equal to the net transfer of heat energy going into this substance or being released by this substance divided by the substance's mass and also divided by the temperature change this substance experiences during this heat energy transfer. And I'll be showing you how to use this later in this video. So this equation tells us that if the heat transfer is high, in other words, Q has a high value, but the change in temperature of the substance remains small. In other words, the substance doesn't heat up or cool down that much. 
then for some unit of mass, m, the specific heat capacity is going to be high. But if the change in temperature is high, when there's only a small change in the amount of heat transfer, then our specific heat capacity is going to be low. Now this heat capacity equation only works when our substances are not undergoing a phase change. So what does this mean? Well, a phase change is when a substance is transitioning from a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a gas. Or we could have the reverse process where a gas is condensing into a liquid or a liquid is solidifying into a solid. We can only use the specific heat equation if the substance's temperature change isn't large enough for the substance to change its phase. And we'll talk more about phase change in the next lesson. So let's use this equation to help us find the temperature increase for both our glass and gold blocks. So what do we know? We know that we're adding heat energy into both these blocks and we're giving both these blocks 5,000 joules of energy. Now, both these blocks are insulated, so none of that heat energy is going to leak away into the environment. We know the initial temperature of both blocks at 25 degrees Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit. The mass of both blocks is one kilogram. We've been given the specific heat capacity of the glass and gold. Now, what we need to find out is the final temperature of the glass and the final temperature of the gold when we transferred 5,000 joules of heat energy to both these blocks. So we can rearrange our specific heat capacity equation to make the temperature difference the subject of the equation. And remember, the temperature difference is simply the final temperature minus the initial temperature of the substance. Now we can add the initial temperature to both sides of the equation, isolating the final temperature of whatever substance we're considering. So Q here is a positive 5,000 joules. The specific heat capacity for gold is 129 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius, and the mass is one kilogram. And then we add the initial temperature at 25 degrees Celsius. So the final temperature for gold is 63.8 degrees Celsius to three significant figures. What about for the glass? Well, we've got all the same values for the variables. The only difference is the specific heat capacity of the glass, which is 837 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. So when we plug all these numbers in, the final temperature of the glass is only 31.0 degrees Celsius to three significant figures. So we can see here that the gold has increased its temperature by about 38 degrees, but the glass has only increased its temperature by around six degrees Celsius. So even though we've added the same amount of heat energy to both our one kilogram blocks, their temperatures are different. Now, where did this energy disappear to? Well, you probably already know that the energy hasn't disappeared. All of the heat energy added to both blocks has increased the block's internal energy. But more of that heat energy has gone into the average kinetic energy of the particles in the gold than in the glass. And remember from a previous lesson, the temperature of a substance is the measure of its particle's average kinetic energy. Therefore, the temperature is higher for gold. And we've got a bar plot here that shows the proportion of energy taken up as potential energy and kinetic energy for both the glass and the gold. Now, the internal energy of both these substances may be different than one another, but their change in internal energy during the heating process is going to be the same. It's just that the glass is storing more of this heat energy as potential energy and less of it as kinetic energy of the particles that make up the substance. Now, if we wanted to determine the heat capacity of water 
for example, we could perform a very simple experiment. We would need an insulated container and we need it to be insulated because we want to prevent any heat energy from entering the system or leaving the system from the outside environment. We want a known mass of water, say something like 0.2 kilograms inside this insulated container. We need a thermometer to measure the water's temperature. We could use an electric propeller to mix the water during the heating process. And we want to mix the water to ensure that there's an equal distribution of heat throughout the volume of water. We need an electric heater that is designed to heat fluids, a power supply with an ammeter and a voltmeter, and a timer. Now the ammeter measures the current from the power supply, and the voltmeter measures the potential difference in the circuit. And when we multiply the current and the voltage we get the power output from the power supply. Now, why is this important? Well, the power output will help us calculate the heat energy in joules being transferred to our mass of water. And remember, power has units of joules per second. So this will be the energy transfer per unit time. So we need to connect the ammeter in series and the voltmeter across the terminals of the immersion heater, so in parallel. Before we turn on the heater, we need our thermometer to reach thermal equilibrium with our cold water. In other words, when the thermometer's temperature value stops changing. When at thermal equilibrium, we can take our first temperature reading, and this will be at time equals zero seconds. When we turn on our power supply, we also need to turn on the propeller to mix the water and the stopwatch at the same time. As soon as we do this, we need to measure the current and the voltage flowing through our heater. And this will give us the power in joules per second being supplied to the water. But what we really need is the heat energy being transferred to the water from the heater over a fixed time frame. So we know from our power equation above that the heat energy is equal to the power multiplied by the time. What we'll do now is measure the temperature of the water and the energy transferred to it every 60 seconds. Let's say our voltage has a constant value of 10 volts and our current is also constant at 3 amps. The power supplied to our heater is equal to 10 volts multiplied by 3 amps, or 30 watts. The addition of heat energy we supply to the water every 60 seconds will be equal to this power supply, this 30 watts, multiplied by the 60 second time interval. So every single minute, we're adding 1,800 joules of heat energy to this water. And because our water is very well insulated in our container, very little of this heat energy is escaping into the environment. So we can assume that every 60 seconds, we're going to have another 1,800 joules of energy added to our water. Now, what would this do to our water? Well, the internal energy of our water will increase, but so will its temperature. So we need to measure the temperature every single minute. And we can do this in our table here. So after about 10 minutes, we should have 11 readings that we can plot on a graph. And the graph should look something like this, with the quantity of heat energy added to the water is on the x-axis, and the temperature of the water is on our y-axis. Now in the first minute or two, you may see a slight curve. And this might occur because the heat in the water will rise to the top before any convection currents become established in the water. So the top of the water will be hotter than the bottom. This is why we have a propeller to try and mix the water and evenly distribute the thermal energy throughout the water. But what we want to do with our graph is find the data points 
that produce a fairly straight line and then draw a line of best fit between them. So all we need to do now from our line of best fit is find out the change in temperature and the change in the amount of heat energy added to the water. And because we know the mass of the water, we can determine its heat capacity with the equation at the beginning of the video. And you should get a value of around 4,186 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius.